you got a lot to cover today. You got a lot of cats. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome back to a brand new The Batman update video. I am absolutely ecstatic today because today's video is an information bomb drop overload of The Batman information. I didn't just say that word, did I? But either way, no, really today is an exciting video because it is going to be probably quite a long one. And that is due to all of the quotes here I've got from Matt Reeves, uh, even Andy Serkis' Alfred. One of my favorite segments of this video will probably be towards the end where we get so much information uh, on Alfred Pennyworth from Andy Serkis. We'll also Robert Pattinson talking about his role, a second movie, how Bruce trained himself and so much more. I really can't wait to get into those details. So it's going to be a bit of a reedy outy session. It's also going to be like a bit of a breakdown in between those paragraphs. So kind of like last week's video, if you guys remember me breaking down some other interviews from various magazines. But today is truly a kind of get your cappuccino, your latte, or your tea, or your soda, or whatever, right, floats your boat. And uh, we, we just chill together and uh, bathe in the Batman glory if you know what I mean. But before we delve into those information bombs from the various freaking magazines, because trust me, it feels like I'm overflowing with magazine information right now, we have Total Film Magazine, as I was making this video, release some even more images for their coverage of interviews for the Batman. So I just want to highlight those on the screen right now. By the way, I just want to say the Total Film Magazine poster, which I used as a part of a thumbnail the other day, is just amazing for the Batman movie. They've got a really cool cover for their magazine, and it's just like Batman with the flare from the movie and a little question mark comes out of the flare with the various characters it's just a stunning stunning detail and amazing cover here we have the new images from the movie that they've got as an exclusive I believe the first one that I'm looking at appears to just be a side profile of Batman with the light hitting the emblem and the torso armor there I've got a feeling I mean obviously this could be any part of the movie but just chucking speculation out there for whatever it's worth I think this could be around the time of the train gang fight scene whether it's before or after he's cracked their skulls so to speak this could just be one of those cinematic kind of side looks at the batman after the fight or maybe as he's preparing to gear up for it the next image i like to call the lads here we have <laughs> lieutenant james gordon with the batman now i think this location guys um, again, could be any location, but it seems to match up to me and where Bruce was going kind of uh, quite mad uh, with all those cops in the room, if you remember. And we have Jim Gordon trying to separate the cops from Batman. Obviously, something at this point in the movie has fractured the GCPD's relationship with the Batman, probably down to Commissioner Pete Savage, the, the corrupt commissioner, putting a bad name on him because as of where it stands, even though Gordon and Batman are very early on in their relationship and they're still learning to trust each other a very quote actually of what we're about to read out and several of the interviews we're about to get into they're still backing each other like Gordon is backing Batman and I believe this location is either around that scene or whether they've gone to Arkham State Hospital to you know talk to the Riddler but just another awesome awesome image there love the little hints of battle damage you get on the cow from the side profile you can see in that lighting it's got a few like knife scrapes against it on top of the other battle worn damage the next image though everyone is of the Batman and Gil Coulson. This is when Bruce has already kind of gone back out, got his duffel bag to change into the Batman gear, goes back into the mayor's funeral where the GCPD had already evacuated everyone out uh, as seen in the funeral clip, which by the way, newsflash, just in case you haven't seen this, but I bet a lot of you have, Matt Reeves saw that that advert was going around, so he was like, hey... You guys can watch a 4K one on my Vimeo if you want to. So that's out there now in 4K. But Bruce has gone back in to help answer the riddles as we see in one of the trailers. He's like, justice. The answer's justice. As Gil Coulson is holding the, the phone taped to his hand, which allows Batman to be on the selfie camera to the Riddler. And I believe this is also being live streamed across all of Gotham at the same time, believe it or not. So this public failure, if you will, of the Batman, I don't really want to call it a failure. I feel a bit harsh there because this is really hard, uh, will be displayed to everyone in Gotham because we know that Gil Coulson's little device around his neck there that has been attached by the Riddler does go kaboom. And despite the Batman's best efforts to answer the Riddler's riddles, 
it seems that something must go awry at some point. Whether Bruce really thought he had the right answer with one of them. And maybe that's where we even get the line from the Riddler saying, Oh, you're really not as smart as I thought you were. And in the trailer, they added on to that Bruce Wayne. But I don't think that is going to be attached to that line. I think that line, as I was just indicating, will be just before he detonates the bomb, the net color bomb. Uh, but again, another cool look at how Gil Coulson has gone from standing up in the trailers to seemingly kneeling down there. This is probably going to be a very tense scene. It's going to start off with a few riddles. Obviously, this man's fearing for his life. But as they get along, I can imagine uh, a suspense being built up through the bomb almost going off whether that be through alarming of ticking or just something like that and as Gil Coulson gets so much more pressurized by this he almost probably kneels to the Batman and is just like help me help me but what he probably doesn't realize or even if he does realize when you're about to die I, I feel like there's that wave of desperation that will come over anyone where it's just like just help me regardless I know you need to answer a riddle about this anyway but just take it off me anyway you, you get irrational and I think maybe that would be such a desperate thing for, like, Batman to confront. There's this scumbag, who he doesn't like, by the way. He doesn't like the DA Gil Coulson because he's a corrupt district attorney. But when you're seeing a human being probably completely relying on you to save their life, and then Batman just doesn't and he gets blown back, that's going to be a really interesting part of the movie. I really can't wait for this scene. Aside from that, everyone, before we get onto those wonderful interviews, we have another Riddler website, Unlock, I believe, and it is of Falcone. Again, just like the image we covered the other day, it was also Falcone taking Selina out of the car on the way to the mayor's funeral. But here we have somewhat of a more kind of, I think they're trying to imitate the Riddler putting up his clues on his clue board. You have Falcone there with a circle around it. You have various new looks at Falcone getting out of a car. Just John Turturro there with slight subtle different looks. We've got Selina being helped out of the car once again at the bottom. I do find it interesting how the Riddler, or if we're meant to believe that this is the Riddler, is it kind of enlarged certain images, one of them being the hand on top of the hand of Falcone and Selina. Maybe that's meant to emphasize and enlarge on a magnifying glass onto the nature of their relationship, which a lot of you guys are speculating about in the comments, whether it's the door to one or whether it's a slightly different kind of one. Uh, it's all interesting to ponder at the end of the day, especially when we have, you know, more and more clues coming out about Selina and her relationship to the criminal underworld and how she's working at the Iceberg Lounge. So to start off the magazine section, on this video, I'm going to be reading out the beginning uh, little cherry pickings I've done of Esquire Middle East. I have cut some parts out just for the sake of getting the main tidbits out of all of these interviews collected together into just this video, if you will. So starting off from Esquire Middle East, we have Matt Reeves saying, A lot of the Batman stories we've seen on film, you see an origin tale. You see his parents killed, and then you see him perfecting himself into becoming Batman. A lot of times you see stories where he's already become Batman. Then the Rose Gallery villain comes in and it's then their story. And you watch him go toe to toe with them. I wanted the main character in the story to be a Batman who was a year in and still trying to figure out how to do this, how to be effective, and he's not necessarily succeeding. He's broken and driven. He'd like to think that he's doing the right thing, that there's another part of him that's struggling right up against the limits. I think his biggest weakness is not realizing the extent to which the person that he's fighting is himself. And again, one of the main inspirations for this movie in terms of graphic novel format is, you know, amongst the long Halloween or Batman Year One, it is Batman Ego. And Matt Reeves, you may have heard, this is what I mean about somewhat recycled words there. You've probably heard me talk about this kind of stuff before. It may sound familiar to you, but the latter of that line is certainly interesting. You know, I think his biggest weakness is not realizing the extent to which the person that he's fighting is, you know, himself. And that is the beast that is Batman. There is no duality between Batman and Bruce Wayne. And I'm not going to repeat myself from prior videos. You guys have heard that before. He is essentially just Batman, which makes him so socially inept when he's talking to mayor candidate Bella Riel in the funeral scene. He's just like, he, he, he almost doesn't like being looked at. Do you know what I mean? He is living, breathing in the Batcave all the time, Going out all night as Batman fighting, sleeping during the day. As Bella Real pointed out, you know, your family were into philanthropy and things like that. But you, by my count, you're not doing anything to help this city. And he's just like, you fucking what, mate? You what? I I'm out every night. But we will see him probably step into the Wayne philanthropy kind of mode. As that blurred line of Batman becomes a bit more distinct in how he can kind of separate Bruce 
from Batman a bit more as the story unfolds, which will be very important. And obviously what we're about to get into even more with some other things. And also when Matt Reeves just loosely says like who was a year in, as he stated before, like it is Batman year two, but he has stated it is around one year and six months in to the very first day he put on the cow. So here we have another line saying, I just knew there was something radically different from anything we'd seen in Batman movies before, says Pattinson. Right from the beginning, there's a desperation to him. He's really working out this rage. All the fights seem very personal. He wants to inflict his kind of justice. He's just compelled to do it. There is no other option, Pattinson continues. I knew very early on I wanted a serial killer type story where the killings would reveal this cooperation between the people who are legitimate pillars in the city and the criminal element in the city. I wanted those things to be entwined. So what he's kind of saying there is, you know, as much as some people want this cooperation or association, these are words that we've heard coming out of interviews recently that are leading people to think the association and cooperation between, you know, the, the victims like the mayor or DA Gil Coulson or Commissioner Pete Savage would mean court of owls through association. I don't think it's meant to be like that. It's just Reeves is simply saying there is you know, these legitimate pillars in the city, and there is a bit of a cooperation between them, and even the criminal element in the city, and obviously the Waynes were also involved in that, unbeknownst to Bruce, and that's the secret Alfred has been keeping for his whole freaking life. Um, and that's obviously going to be a revelation in the movie that Batman kind of learns. And it's the very mission that Riddler is exposing, and how there is somewhat of a bit of a, you know, there is a bit of a group, or in a ring, if you will, that, do, that are the pillars of the city, and are controlling it, and making matters worse. A corrupt police commissioner, a corrupt district attorney, a corrupt mayor like how it keeps going on even the biggest names the elite citizens like thomas and martha wayne despite not knowing how corrupt they were or if it was just one of two of them for example they were a part of this too no, no pun intended there but the rich citizens of gotham the, the royalty as matt reeves puts it were even a part of this, and that is what Riddler is exposing, albeit through very <laughs> questionable methods. But Reeves goes on to say that Batman is investigating these crimes, all of which point to the history of the city, and that history eventually comes back to his own family history. It starts to shake his very core and causes him to have an awakening and to change. So again, like, to people who say, like, oh, that's so spoilery, like, we already, you know, no, I mean, Reeves is even saying himself, he's not afraid to say that history eventually comes back to his own family history. So it's obviously, you know, one on one, oh, Wayne's have something to do with this as well. And I like how he says it causes him to have an awakening and to change. This will probably be one of the catalysts that makes Bruce, you know, he, he's on this mission, right? And he always treats almost every thug or villain he comes across, as Pattinson said himself, almost as if they're the people or the person who killed his own mother or father. And by the way, when Pattinson said, just to update on that quote right now, who killed his own mother, some people were saying, that means Thomas Wayne is still alive because he only said his mother? No, I think that's just a bit, a bit more of a loose sentence. It's like saying he's envisioning every thug that he's beating up to be the one who killed his mother. It is it is meant to mean both parents, but, you know, he just kind of just said, for the sake of it, his mother kind of thing. Don't read too into that. By the way, that is the very thing that drives him, right? As it is in a lot of Batman stories. It's the catalyst that forms the character of Batman and kind of leaves behind the character of Bruce Wayne before he learns that you can have a bit of a duality there is what this film is tackling. But the thing I wanted to lean into there is that the, the very thing that Matt Reeves is saying here when it comes back to his own family history, it starts to shake his very core and causes him to have an awakening and to change. That will probably somewhat change his philosophy and principles on why he's being Batman. Not that he's not going to think, oh, I'm not doing this for my parents anymore at all. But when he learns whatever the nature and severity of his family's involvement in the state of Gotham and corruption, this revelation will cause him to have an awakening and a change to how he probably deals with how he asserts himself as Batman. He might not be as rage-filled and as impulsive and reckless 
as he is as we see him in the trailers when he puts a few more pieces of the puzzle together and it causes him to step back and reevaluate this criminological experiment as Matt Reeves puts it and how he kind of goes about that and I think ultimately the bottom line is that will develop him into a less reckless less impulsive Batman not that he's not going to be angry anymore because Batman always is very angry but you get what I'm saying he's going to evolve and a big part of that evolution will be the very foundation that he built this crusade upon was a little bit of a lie in, in a way kind of because you can't really get rid of the very fact that his parents did die which also springboarded him to becoming this. You, you get what I'm saying. To touch on some Riddler stuff we have, I started thinking of the Zodiac Killer because he did create a costume for himself and he wore a black hood. He had his own insignia. He was an early anti-superhero, a scary figure who terrorized California, says Reeves. That immediately made me think, oh, that could be a brand new version of the Riddler. And I completely agree with this. I think it's a very, very interesting concept to base the Riddler on with the Zodiac Killer. It depends how much you guys know about him in real life, like a literal serial killer. And the way he uniquely went about contacting the, the police department with the ciphers and stuff. And the way that that really does kind of blend in well with this Batman story. I have to give it to Reeves. It's a very interesting um, cocktail he's got going here. But here we have Dano saying, I read quite a bit about serial killers in general, which wasn't like reading. I found it so challenging that I had to go to the coffee shop and read. I just needed more friendly surroundings to read that stuff. Like, because it does get dark and twisted when you are not only obviously reading in on serial killers, but the Zodiac Killer in of himself. Somebody who's never been caught despite all the, like, oh, we think we found the Zodiac Killer reporting kind of things as of, you know, even last year. It's, it's twisted stuff. And to obviously engulf yourself in that as an actor must be very challenging. Dano also found, the more he studied the script, that his Riddler was more than just a Zodiac Killer with a question mark stitched on. The character that Matt would write had the same emotional complexity of his Batman. He was a human too, one shaped by the world that raised him, just as Bruce Wayne was. I realized Batman is born in trauma. And so are some of the villains, says Dano. And this gets into what we read out from my magazine uh, breakdown of Empire. Of whenever that dropped, I can't remember now, all the videos are blurring into one. But it's true, a lot of Batman's rogues gallery and Edward Nashton in this very here movie is no different. Batman and him and even other characters like Oz, Selina, they all share interesting parallels of how they are all characters who come from some form of trauma, right? But there are variables in everyone's stories and Bruce goes down the road of becoming Batman. Oz becomes a person who kind of compensates in the criminal underworld for his insecurities and, and God knows what else. That's a very simplified version. I'm not just saying that's all there is to the Penguin. But the same here with Riddler from his orphan days and whatever the Waynes have to do with that in this movie and how everything comes together and how he's a victim of the cesspool of this city, as he puts it, that Gotham is. It forged him to become this own kind of person who's trying to do something like the Batman is doing, just in a very sadistic way, obviously, through killing people and killing the elite and pointing that out. So, again, it is more interesting to me when villains aren't just villains for villains' sake, albeit that can be very interesting, such as the Joker sometimes leans into that. Sometimes there are more interesting backstories to Joker, like Todd Phillips' Joker, and where there's a mental health decline, which is usually my favorite one, by the way, rather than just falling in a chemical vat and going crazy. But obviously Joker can just be villain for villain's sake, and that mystery makes it so interesting in that iteration where you don't really know what caused him to have that one bad day. But usually, villains being born of trauma, just like how Batman is born of trauma and he's a hero, is such an interesting, interesting thing and lens to look at all of this myth at, really. And, you know, something that we all adore from just Batman and all of his rogues gallery members. It's, I, I love, I, this is why I love reading out this magazine stuff in these videos. But continuing on, as Batman raced after Gotham's latest serial killer, leaving him clues as to how he was choosing his victims, Reeves started to see other classic characters appear in his mind's eye. Perhaps he wandered into a nightclub and met its proprietor, the Penguin still in the early days of his career before he achieved kingpin status. Maybe he would follow the city officials and gangsters that populated the nightclub along the way running into Selina Kyle, the Catwoman. Perhaps one of the gangsters was Carmine Falcone. It was never an attempt to say like, hey, let's just have every single big Batman character that you could possibly 
have. It, it was more asking, how do we tell the story in such a way that we reveal the classic Warner Brothers noir fabric of Gotham? And then that just presented all of these opportunities to have new versions of classic characters. And that was really exciting for me, says Reeves. That's another interesting thing in of itself with all of this. And I've just had this discussion with many friends, just like new Gotham, new characters. But really what Reeves is doing here and, and it's fascinating to me because it feels like he's always, he, what he's describing as new here or whatever is something that isn't new to me. It's always what I viewed these characters in Gotham for, which is why I'm such a fanboy of this vision of this movie. And this trilogy and Batverse and Reevesverse that he's forging with many, many years of content to come. You can be sure about that. It's just the way he's capturing this vision it's new for the silver screen i guess you could say um in ways it's not that it hasn't been incorporated in little tidbits throughout the movies like detective stuff and i guess you could say this that or the other but this is honing in on what i why i call it definitive batman and what will hopefully be definitive batman with at least what it's striving to do as we're going into this movie with all of the information that we're getting out of it but truly the only point here i'm trying to make is this being described as new, never before seen Batman or Bruce Wayne or Gotham or the grungy this, that or the others and the new versions of the character like Riddler. I guess that could be new, I suppose, with the specific concept of the Zodiac Killer. But overall, this isn't new to me. This is like coming home for me to, to a Batman that is definitive Batman. I really mean that. It's not new to me. This is the Batman that Reeves is forging. It's just not technically. It is new. It's got a sheen of new over it because ironically enough, we haven't had a all round, all round putting as much Batman and as many facets, because I guess, it, you know, he is multifaceted into one cocktail of a movie and then kind of such weird hand gestures right now, blossoming out the, the most definitive Batman you can possibly create. And as what we've heard from Dylan Clark, the producer, and Matt Reeves, that is that has always been their goal, to make the best Batman ever. And I feel like they, they might very well be. We've got some more interesting comments here about just that flavor and mood with how this quote says, you could tell by the casting what he was going for. You started hearing about who else was in the film. And incidentally, we all live within a couple of blocks of each other, says Totoro. There's at least five of us in the film that could walk to each other's apartments. A lot of times, credible, really smart actors don't want to be in a comic book movie. I think we all kind of get why or whatever, but Matt has a lot of credibility in the movie Making Space with Actors. So I think they all wanted to go on that exploration with him, which is interesting. I love hearing that because, again, some people just don't want to be in a comic book movie. Sometimes they're not always great. Um, sometimes, even if they are popular, they might just be kind of mid, if you know what I mean. And do you always want to bring... I'm not saying every actor out there is a really big egomaniac or whatever, but they're sometimes thinking, do I want to bring what I've got in my belt buckle of Pokemon badges of movies, so to speak, my, my name to a comic book movie, unless I know it's damn damn good. But with Matt, he's got a lot of credibility. So I'm not trying to say the Batman isn't a comic book movie. It's so much better than all the other comic books. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it's definitely appealing to actors who might not consider being in a comic book movie or any comic book movie. Let me rephrase that to say, because it is definitely striving for a certain caliber than that of your typical comic book movie, if you know what I mean. So I hope you understand what I'm saying with that. Matt, as a filmmaker, is someone who concentrates on the emotional heart of a story. And I think in this case, the heart beats very, very, very loudly underneath this dystopian Gotham says circus. Now Esquire got into a little bit of sequel talk and we'll get on to what Pattinson says a little bit later but Matt Reeves may have finally told the psychological noir Batman he'd always dreamed of, one that checked all the boxes of what he'd hoped a Batman story could be. But while he didn't want the story to interact with other aspects of the DC expanded universe, he didn't want this story to be a one-off like Todd Phillips's Oscar winning Joker. While this may be year two, his Batman sets up a world built to sustain many years to come. Stories he hopes he can tell himself, which is why I've been calling it a trilogy this whole time, even though people were like, you don't know it's a trilogy. 
Oh, I do, basically. <laughs> so there's no question it's going to continue on long after this. It's great, because it's a great myth. It allows itself to almost endless reinterpretation. There's been so many iterations, and what was important for me, critical for me, was I could not go into doing this one without feeling like we would have something definitive to say about this myth. I think that a lot of these great myths have that power, which is that if they truly resonate, they allow you to find a way to take the aspects of it that people love and then do something new with it. And then people connect to it all over again. And I hope that's what we've done. Now, Esquire.com also tackled this question with even more kind of affirmation of the, the larger expanding Reeves verse. He says, I'm very proud of it. I felt it was the best version of the story that we could possibly do to justify having another Batman. You always have to have a reason. And from the beginning, that was the mission for me. Sequels and Gotham City based spin-offs are being planned. It's safe to assume they will remain Aquaman free. The reason why they're saying that is because they were tackling, you know, the larger DCEU stuff, the connectivity and all that stuff. But here, at least for now, it will obviously have a lot to do with how people receive this film, Reeves says. But a lot of things are in the works. And obviously we know we've got the Gotham PD series. We know we've got the Colin Farrell Penguin Rise to Power thing in early development. And what's going on there is still yet to be fully, fully realized, but it's basically looking good. We may even have a rumored Catwoman series. And I know that sounds a bit like, oh my God, are they bloating this, that? Is there gonna be a freaking guy down the street series from whatever street in the movie? I get what some people are saying there, but not to mention the second and third film. It is really, especially with this movie needs to come out. They're never going to officially say we're, we've got to release a Batman number two before the freaking first movie has even come out. But it's always been discussions have most certainly been had about, hey, are we going to do more than one film? Yes, of course. It just, you know, you need to kind of have the first movie out before you officially say a sequel to the Batman has been greenlit, if you know what I mean. But obviously, self-explanatory wise, it's always been the case, especially with the HBO Max productions in the, the loop as well. So as for the Esquire.com stuff I wanted to talk about, we've got another quote from Reeves saying, early on when I was writing, I started listening to Nirvana. And there was something about something in the way, which is in the first trailer, which is part of the voice of that character. When I considered how do you do Bruce Wayne in a way that hasn't been seen before? I started thinking, what if some tragedy happened? For example, Wayne seeing his parents murdered and this guy becomes so reclusive, we don't know what he's doing. Is this guy some kind of wayward, reckless drug addict? And, and the truth is that he is a kind of drug addict. His drug is his addiction to his drive for revenge. He's like a Batman Kurt Cobain. Now, now some people have taken that quote and just kind of not turn their nose up at it, we're kind of, but somewhat maybe questioning, eh, I don't know if he's, eh. but the way you're meant to read that is like, no, Batman isn't like a little drug addict, it's, it's speaking larger to, and it's a very simplified version of what they've gotten to before when Batman, in this criminological experiment, is just going out there every night and he is addicted to doing that because it is a kind of therapy for him with his mission and crusade that he's got going. And how you can liken that too, especially with how this is a bit of a grungy theme and tone inspired movie with Kurt Cobain, not only visually, but in other facets bleeding onto the character of Bruce as an inspiration in this movie. The Kurt Cobain aspect is that yes, he had an addiction, but you can liken that to Bruce Wayne and his addiction for vengeance in, in what he does every night. You have to be addicted to doing what he's doing in this movie. And that's all that Matt Reeves is saying there. But yeah, I get what some people are like saying, oh, like, you know, Batman's a drug addict. You know, no, he's not. But just just, just read the actual quote and <laughs> it should speak to you in what he's really getting on about there. And um, to me, I'm a big Nirvana fan. So this, this definitely suits. I get what he's saying there. And I really agree with what other quotes I've picked out here. This other bullet point I've got is saying, there has been no actor when his announcement that he was going to be playing Batman in one of the feature films was announced that has not received backlash. True, completely true. But what he says next, even more so, the people, and this is what I was experiencing, the people who were excited, I knew it was because they knew Rob's work post Twilight. Exactly. The people who weren't excited, I knew it was because they didn't know <laughs> Rob's work post Twilight. I had mutuals on my Twitter feed, not, not not knocking any of my mutuals, but some of them were just like, oh my god. And I was tweeting at a time, just like, you haven't seen past Twilight, have you? And even in Twilight, 
you could argue it's not Rob. It's the goddamn Twilight movies and what they try to do. That is great. Don't put that on the actor. Do you know what I mean? But even even if you want to do that, people who are bitching, and this isn't like a this isn't a video breaking down the the casting of Robert Pattinson, but it's been something that has been out here for quite a while. Obviously, when people were just shitting on him, and it's just like for crying out loud. Yeah, I'm just gonna move on because this is an old conversation. But you know what I'm saying. So, and I love that Matt Reeves felt the need to say that, because it's true. In The Batman, Wayne Manor is depicted as falling to bits. He doesn't care about any of the trappings of being a millionaire Wayne at this point, Reeves says. Citing Gus Van Sant's last days, the 2005 fictionalized version of Kurt Cobain's sad, slow demise. And in brackets, this is interesting, just like that film, we'll apparently see amps stacked up in a storage room. Eh? Amps? Like, wait, 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 really? Like, am I completely misinterpreting this, or are we going to see, like, Bruce? Because some people have been theorizing, what if we get, like, a train training scene in the Batcave where he is listening to, like, literal grunge music? That would be pretty dope, I'm not going to lie. I don't think that's too on the nose either. Like, it makes sense to me, if you are going out every night, you know, I mean, I put on music before I do a video to get me a bit pumped up in energy, so imagine bringing Bruce Wayne and training or whatever, right? You're going out, you want to listen to something like, I don't know, Nirvana's... Floyd the Barber. That would get me going like, bah, da, 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 da. <laughs> and you're just getting ready, you know? Listen to Floyd the Barber or Nirvana's Milk It. That would be another great one in the drop of that song where it just goes dull steak and, and he just lets loose. I'm not saying there is going to be tracks literally playing over this film in a CW style song over scene approach. But I could really imagine an actual Nirvana song playing over something, whether it's a training montage or like a Batmobile chase, but it is quite on the nose sometimes. They, they have to be very careful when actually using lyrics and a song mixed into a movie. It has to be very delicately done, other, otherwise it just does come across a bit like, almost like, a, not like a fan edit, but just putting over song over scene. It needs to be a bit more woven than that, even when it comes to Nirvana but I hope they do do something like that. I can imagine him getting kind of ready and pumped up before he goes out on a night listening to a heavy grunge song of Nirvana's. This one really intrigued me, really intrigued me, and it's not like I didn't have these ideas anyway, especially if we know that Bruce Wayne is living in Wayne Tower, the penthouse. Wayne Manor is basically falling to pieces. It was made a Gotham orphanage, but here it says the new Batcave is based on a secret underground railway that still exists in New York. The idea being that some of these wealthy industrious families had private train cars at the turn of the century. So the Batcave is actually in the foundation of this tower. It was another way of saying, how can we root all of these things in things that feel real, but also extraordinary? So again, I love that he probably does literally take the elevator down in a very classical Batman way. I don't know if they're going to be as on the nose with like tilting a, a statue head or whatever, but you know, we do see in a corner, maybe I'm showing on screen, a, a very elevatory looking thing. And considering the fact that we know that Bruce is living in the city, very quick access to being Batman, getting down to the Batcave, getting out into the city, the, the freaking subway is at the foundation of the tower, as we're hearing here. Well, elevator straight down. Bang. There you have it. And, um, yeah, I just like that he's not only a watchful protector of Gotham City, but literally, he can open his windows and there's Gotham City. We've even got a, uh, a bit of footage of that in the B-roll footage uh, from the last DC fandom that you're probably seeing on screen. And Batman is looking out at his beautiful city, or gloomy city, shall we say. Gotham. And finally, a new Batmobile. The Nolan films establish the Batmobile as a tank, which was a brilliant idea, Reeves says. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool if this guy's a loner and a gearhead and fashioning these things by himself, taking parts of other cars and kit cars? So it's recognizable as a car this time, but it's like a muscle car, one that he's made himself. One thing I am a huge, 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 huge fan of. It's not that I'm not a big fan of the other things, it's more like, again, this is definitive Batman for me because it's taking a lot of uh, creative decisions that I feel I would want for the character and I would also opt for a Batmobile of this like as well. And I'm completely subscribed to the other ones and maybe you have the preference set at but maybe if I was rich and if I was making this character in the movie, uh, I would have him utilize more of Wayne R&D like uh, the Nolan films did. But for me, the way that he's made it into an actual car, a muscle car, is so much more grounded, yet whilst being fantastical at the same time, this movie 
to an aspect of the character that I would deliver on screen myself as well. Again, this is why I resonate with the frequency and waves of Reeves' vision so much myself. So up next, we have some really interesting scoops from The River, which is a Japanese website. It has been translated from Japanese, so I do want to say some of this might not be insanely 100% accurate to what the accurate translation is, but you get the overall idea. Like, so, you know, this is all true stuff actually said in an interview, but, you know, translated. Just bear that in mind. They asked him, um, it's the best. Um, talking about previous comment, do you want to continue playing the role of Batman? And he says, lightly, yes, by all means. I also love the story Matt draws. I also like the place where the characters end up in the movie. And that, by the way, just in by itself, that line, I also like the place where the characters end up in the movie, already kind of suggests to me that, I'm not saying Bruce is like monumentally grown, but he's in like a place where he can look back and retrospect with what Matt Reeves has said, with how cr like impulsive and reckless he was. And he can kind of, after putting to bed the Riddler and whatever happens with resolving that, go from a place from here on out, maybe he's closer with Andy Serkis' Alfred, where they pick up, obviously, it's a bit of a fractured relationship and strained, if anything. I, can, I just like where he says, I also like the place where the characters end up in this movie, because it really feels like it will bolster a bit more of an experienced Batman to lead into that second movie. But he continues to say, and I won't interject again, I think we can develop it in any way after, you know, when the, after where the characters end up in the movie. It feels like a reinvention of the character and a completely different view of the world is drawn. I'm really interested in what he does in the second film. More films! I mean, I knew that was going to happen anyway, but yep, yeah, heard it from Pattinson there himself. It's not like he kind of really confirmed there is a second film, but he's had conversations to assume, okay, if we're going to do a second film, which I don't see why this movie would flop, it's still probably going to make quite a lot of money. You know, let's just assume we're making a second film. Matt, let's talk about this. And that's why he's saying I'm really interested in, you know, what he does in the second film. And that's why I believe he said to Empire, he's already uh, forged a little uh, psychological map for Bruce Wayne and Batman for the second and third movie. Now, I believe the next question they ask is, Batman in this work seems to be fighting for anger. However, I think it will take a huge amount of energy to continue fighting with anger as the driving force. Pattinson says, that's right. If there is any enemy, energy can be obtained from it. It's really unhealthy. Laughs. <laughs> After all, such energy turns into dark energy, which eventually hurt me. But Bruce has been accumulating pain for 20 years, and this time it will be released around. For Bruce, being Batman is like a strange therapy in many ways, and I'm dependent on it. Perhaps his greatest fear is the mask being stripped off, revealing the fact that Batman is Bruce Wayne. It's almost death to him. He fought that way as Batman. So that's right, it requires a huge amount of energy, but he also receives a huge amount of energy from the existence of the enemy. So like, yeah, speaking to the larger, the fact that the enemy is like so living and breathing in Gotham, that provides him with his lust and energy to do this in the first place, but it also does take a massive taxing toll on being, you know, or the energy that they're describing here. Again, this could be due to translation. I don't know if energy is the right word, um, but you, you get what they're saying there. And I like, I love how Pattinson got into, you know, perhaps his greatest fear is the mask being stripped off, revealing that the fact that Batman is Bruce Wayne. The way I read that is he doesn't want the cow taken off him because that is death when he is in Batman mode because he doesn't have that distinction between Bruce and Batman. And again, I don't want to repeat myself and repeat myself there. But I just see this almost tragic kind of like poeticness to what he just said there. Whereas let's just say the mask was taken off, right? Let's just say that's what the GCPD cops were doing on that stretcher in that room as what you're seeing on screen. That's why he's lashing out because maybe Batman was knocked out and they're like, oh, well, let's peek under the cow. To do that to him would reveal who is under the mask. And to him, under the mask doesn't exist. There is no under the mask. When he is out there in this movie, not saying they aren't going to forge the duality for those who really say, yes, there is Bruce and yes, there is Batman. I know. But at least where he's at right now to take that mask off him would to make him feel more naked than you could ever 
be naked. And that is, you would see almost like, you know, in Harry Potter, when you have the little Voldemort underneath the train station, he's like crying away. That would be like a little version of Bruce, the, the boy that is there. The, the, the boy that is fueling this anger and rage to be a grown-ass 31-whatever-year-old Batman doing all of this. So, as Pattinson says, perhaps his greatest fear is the mask being stripped off, revealing the fact that Batman is Bruce Wayne. It's almost death to him. Because without that mask on, and as it's been described, the line is blurred between Batman and Bruce Wayne. There is basically no Bruce. They are the same right now that will be developed on in future movies. He will learn to realize, oh, maybe I should be a bit more me or whatever, right? That's the whole Batman ego part of this movie and the inspirations, which is why you should read Batman Ego, by the way. Great, great, great psychological take on Batman. But anyway, back onto my point. I just love the fact that without that cowl on, which is why he goes out every night, because he gets to be himself, his pure inner self, taking that off, it would reveal something and a character of his own self that he hasn't really visited since the night his parents died. And that is just uh, this raw articulation on that, which I really love of what Pattinson did here. I, 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 I trust that you get what I'm saying there. That articulation of the mask being stripped off, revealing that Batman is Bruce Wayne is almost death to him. That's because he obviously doesn't want to be Bruce Wayne. Batman was born of that moment, and that's, I guess, the somewhat, I guess you could say, um, mental health of Batman. You know, the fact that he kind of put away Bruce Wayne and became Batman from that moment on. He, he can't relive that form of personality, of which he will come to terms with, as I keep mentioning. Um, but right now, that's at least where he's at in year two. And that is fascinating to me. Then they ask, in the trailer, a group like a gangster says, what are you going to do? And Batman says, revenge. I didn't say justice. Now, I think the translation here where he says revenge, it's meant to mean vengeance. Again, translation. Um, but he didn't think of himself as justice at that time, Pattinson says. In the main story, I think Batman at this point didn't even think that this city will change. He thought that the city was in the midst of a constant corruption. So what he's doing is just an eye for an eye sanction. If someone does evil, he will do evil to him too. That was his own justice, but it's completely different from true justice. That's why he's revenge, or vengeance if you will, and revenge comes from something that is emotional. Now the next comments from Premier France, so again might be a slight translation whatever here, so if anything weird pops up you know why. But Reeves gets into the training of Batman, and this is something that I, I have got a bit to say on, a bit to say on. So, as the playboy Bruce Wayne had already been dealt with, another angle had to be found. I started to imagine him as an aristocrat, someone who was almost of royal lineage, and to whom tragedy had happened. I was listening to Something in the Way by Nirvana while writing, and little by little I had the idea of a decadent rock star who watches the world crumble around him, says Matt Reeves. Now here we are. It meant that he was not going to be hefty. And I love this description because to all the people who don't like the physique of Robert Pattinson, <laughs> but rather thin and strong at the same time. And by the way, I, I'm not middle fingering people who um, like the idea of a larger Batman. I, I mean, I'm open to all iterations. It's the people who like scold him for being the body type he is. That's is still a very, very valid take. And he's not skinny, but anyway, ran over. <laughs> but rather thin and strong at the same time. More tactical, more agile. He trained himself. He knows exactly where it hurts when he hits someone. I wanted realistic fights, that we really feel the blows, because it is the expression of his torment interior. Anything that gets in his way must be torn down. A scene from the trailer sums it up well, the one where we see Batman electrocute a guy with his taser. I wanted Goodfellas style brutality, when Henry Hill smashes a guy with his gun butt. In the movie, Henry is the one who introduces you to some really creepy people. But when he does that, you know he's part of the gang now. Robert immediately understood the idea. So the, my biggest takeaway here is, other than I really agree with the thin and strong at the same time, more tactical, agile. Again, um, I love this comparison people make online to like a, a perfect and very valid Batman take can be the form and physique of an MMA fighter. It doesn't have to be roided, almost like uh, Dark Knight Returns Batman, which is, you know, BVS warehouse fight scene, beautiful demonstration of Batman combat and a Batman Dark Knight Returns Frank Miller vibe that I completely agree with, I really do. But to say that like Pattinson's physique with the MMA type fight that physique that he has is irrelevant is so wrong. That, yeah, I, I, I can't go there because I, this is going to start like a whole argument I'm having with myself. 
about with those people. But again, it is very valid. And I love Reeves kind of uh, backing up the thin yet strong, agile, tactical at the same time that Reeves, that sorry, that Pattinson's Batman is in this movie. But he reveals, guys, he trained himself. He trained himself. He knows exactly where it hurts when he hits someone. Now, I've been saying for a long time, this is one of the details I would have loved to get a scoop on for the longest time, and now we've just had it. But I don't think this closes the chapter on more training overall, if that makes sense. So just because Reeves said here that he trained himself, doesn't mean that he actually, that's the only training he had. Hey guys, Future Boba here. So whilst editing this video, I basically go on a little bit of a ramble talking about Bruce training himself with that comment from Reeves, you know, he trained himself. And I kind of speculate that even though that was said, it, it still might not be strictly true because he, when you kind of put everything under the umbrella of training yourself, that doesn't mean that you might not seek expertise in various places or that you still might be trained, but you capitalize on it yourself. Well, it turns out I was kind of right because the novel that you may have heard of before because we spoke about it here on the channel, Before the Batman, an original movie novel, the all new exciting story inspired by the film. It's basically a canonized prequel to the Batman getting into a bit of his roots and I've basically been sent some information that yes Bruce did not only get trained by Alfred in fact Alfred jokes and calls it Bruce Jitsu because in his SAS days he got taught several forms of martial arts and he kind of melds it into one for training Bruce and calls it Bruce Jitsu which never fails to kind of make Bruce groan like a uh kind of thing but not only that Bruce when studying for university uh, just kept dropping out of different places and went to various places around the world whenever he wanted Wanted to enroll in a new place he also learned from various experts there as well and kind of took that information back with him and kind of capitalized on it himself if you will so like it's kind of as i preemptively and intuitively thought that he did kind of train himself as Matt Reeves said but like he also did gather lots and lots not only from Alfred but various people around the world when he did actually travel for education um but yeah also took quite a few lessons away with him as well and I will be looking into doing a breakdown of that novel soon um it is a children's kind of novel but there is some concrete information that does flesh out a lot of the context to the man, you know, that was forged to become the Batman that we see in the trailers and the movie that we're about to watch in just a month's time. It is kind of some trivial stuff, but like some of it is actually pretty damn interesting. So here's a little bit of a tidbit for you anyway. I've got so much more to read out, but we are already a long ways in this video. So I might have to save it for another one. Like I, yeah, I've got more and I can't keep this going on, but I am going to go through the stuff I really want to read out. So we have another quote, and I believe this is from Pattinson talking to Premier of France saying, I sincerely believe that the tone of the Batman has nothing to do opposed to the previous movies. It feels new. In the comics, Batman is someone more unstable. If you read between the lines, it's actually very sad. And this is what I love about these quotes, by the way, because it shows you how much of a fan Pattinson is. And he's just not an actor taking a job being like, okay, I think I know. The he really is a big fan, a huge fan, in fact, as um, spoken about in many interviews. But whereas in the cinema, it's always his heroic side that is put forward, Pattinson says. The Batman does the opposite. We capture his inner bubbling of the character. In my opinion, the only other to achieve this is the animated film Batman Mask of the Phantasm. When I saw it, it clicked. Being Batman is a kind of curse. It's a burden. But hey man, you decided that, right? No, 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 no. I have to be Batman. I was chosen, not the other way around. I don't think we've ever really seen that in a live film. So, ah, uh, just hearing Patterson talk about Mask of Phantasm, how, you know, it, the, the Batman, unlike other films, really get into the bubbling. And again, that's really just larger talk for, like, the psychoanalytical approach to this character that this movie is doing. Hence, Batman ego inspirations, etc., etc., etc. And how he even references something a fan could really understand. And that shows how Pattinson is a fan where he says, the only other thing, in my opinion, really to achieve this is Batman Mask of Phantasm. It's just like, well... He knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's talking about. Um, so yeah, really, really dig that. But Deadline Magazine Germany, and I'm going to end the video here. There is more to say, but it's going to have to be another video. They speak to Andy Serkis, and this gives us some really cool information. A look at past Batman adaptations revealed that Alfred Pennyworth was either comic relief or Batman's wise advisor. How does your Alfred differ from previous interpretations of the character? Andy Serkis says, The story of the film begins at a point where Bruce Wayne and Alfred's relationship is very strained. You could even say fragile. 
Alfred desperately tries to stop his young master from making the wrong decisions. Bruce Wayne separates himself more and more from Alfred in order to live in his very own world. This, in turn, makes Alfred painfully aware that he will never be the father figure he was meant to be to Bruce Wayne. It's a burden he has to carry. And Deadline asks, you're known for playing larger than life characters. Accordingly, Alfred stands out from your previous roles, as the character demands a very down to earth approach from you. How has this challenged you? Andy Serkis then says, Matt Reeves deliberately chose me for this role because at its core, it was very much my own personality. Personally, I'm a very down to earth guy myself, which is why it wasn't difficult for me to get used to the role. I was also intrigued by the possibility of playing a character who had failed in his parental aspirations, an aspect that Matt also wanted to emphasize very strongly. And this is where it gets even more interesting. Deadline asks, what does the current version of Alfred have to offer when it comes to helping Batman fight crime? Andy Serkis then says he's an excellent code breaker and intelligence expert. All of this is no coincidence. Given that Alfred has a background to match, he used to be a member of the SAS. And there you have it. So Codebreaker, oh, that's going to come in handy when Bruce is in the Batcave. And, you know, there's a few Riddler ciphers there. And maybe even Alfred can help out there. Again, I love this this kind of collaboration there that they're forming between this slightly, well, younger, because as I've always gone into, you've had the Michael Caine Alfreds and things like that. But this one's Andy Serkis. He's a bit younger. Batman Earth 1 vibes. Gotham, Fox's Gotham vibes. I love the modern takes on Alfred because he is still the butler Alfred, but... He's a bit more, you know, agile himself. He really is. And the fact that he used to be a member of the SAS, how that will help Batman in this movie with code breaking and an intelligence expert. And not to mention, as we were just talking about with training, maybe in the in the former years, um, it could be something just that will make, who knows, possibly a favorite iteration of Alfred for many, many fans out there after this movie. Him talking about the strained relationship with Bruce, him wanting to have this idea of after the Waynes died and how he'd be a, a parental figure, but it didn't quite work out that way. Not for his own fault, I'm sure, because Bruce would have been completely convicted in his ideology to be the Batman that no matter what Alfred would have done, it would have always ended up this way. But the, the kind of, um, almost guilt he has over that, probably out of his loyalty to Thomas and Martha. He's probably thinking, I, I promised I would maybe look after this kid, but look at what he's turned into. Thomas would hate me for this. Like, he's literally going out and beating people up all night. He's using all of his resources to do this. He never attends Wayne board meetings or anything. Like He's probably thinking he's done a terrible thing or a job. And that's so sweet of Alfred to almost consider. Somewhere in the course of this movie, as I keep saying, it would draw Bruce and Alfred more closer together than ever. And I think Alfred already does get what Bruce is doing. He just fully hasn't subscribed to it yet or hasn't fully, should I say. But the, he'll realize that this is the sound of inevitability for Bruce and Batman and that he will get on board and just be like, you know what? You're already 100 miles per hour in this. Let's go and make it 110 miles per hour. But with me, with you along for the ride as well. So I think that's what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, just it's it's great hearing more Andy Circus stuff. And there is even more. But we're going to have to tackle that another time. If you got to this part of the video, by the way, just let me know. Just let me know by leaving the hashtag down in the comments with whatever comment you might have left anyway. I don't know. Let's make it an easy one. Hashtag. You got a lot of cats. Other than that, guys, like the video, do subscribe. If, you, if you've got this far and you're not subscribed, I don't know what you're doing. You may as well subscribe for more videos just like this. I will keep you up to date with the Batman. You can count on me for that and post content going into the future Reeves verse and Batverse that will be forged after this film is released. Follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Just do all of that good stuff. The links are in the top pinned comment or in the video description. But I'm gonna have to love you and leave you guys. I, I need to get to editing this video. It's, it's been going on for too long. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. And I'll see you members of the Bat family in the next video. Goodbye.